Hi, welcome everyone to this panel session, Fashion Forward, Transforming the Textile Industry. I'm Alexandra Weston, um, which at Holt Renfrew, and some of the areas that I oversee include Holt Renfrew's sustainability team, the sustainable edit program, and H Project Department, which is a department dedicated to products creating positive change. Now, I'm gonna jump in. You've probably all heard a plethora of upsetting facts like the video just shared, uh, around the effects of the textile industry. Facts such as more than 8% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are produced by the apparel and footwear industry. Or that 20 to 25% of globally produced chemical compounds are utilized in the textile finishing. After more than a decade of being in sustainability in fashion, I still find these facts really shocking. But what I find even more shocking is for such a deeply creative industry like fashion to actually be so traditional and slow to modernize, especially when it comes to production practices that are more responsible and are especially transparent. The most exciting shift which we saw in the video that I've also seen over the past few years is the unexpected ways in which fashion and science have come together leading to an explosion of innovation and disruption to this traditional mindset. And new material innovations are a big part of this output. Think biodesign fabrics made of algae or root systems of mushrooms or from our own food waste. And I bet you would never imagine that you would be wearing the food you put in your compost bin and not because your toddler threw it at you, but because of food to fabric technology re-engineering it into wearable fashion. If we are to truly transition into a net zero world, it requires a massive and interconnected global effort to support the deployment and adoption of new innovations that can create a more sustainable future. A shift in thinking is finally happening and is so exciting, but it needs everyone to help support it with its success. As a retailer in the fashion lifestyle space, we are not producers ourselves. So the role when it comes to transforming the textile industry specifically is to educate, connect, engage, amplify, and of course, support. We are the bridge between the market and the producers and can try and influence on both sides while setting best in class targets for our own operations. We strive to be a platform to amplify the important stories and messages behind the brands and the individuals who are making a difference. In short, we aim to ignite positive change which brings us to being here today on this literal platform, and I am honored to introduce our panelists for this session and get started. So, uh, Myra Arshud, co-founder and, uh, and CEO of Alltext, Roya Ajiji, uh, CEO of Light One, Leslie Harwell, co-founder and general partner of Alante Capital, and Adam Tobin Flugel, Creative Director and Responsibility Lead, Triarchy. So let's jump in. Um, Leslie, I'll start with you. Uh, Alante Capital invests in innovative early stage companies, I think currently 13 in the portfolio, uh, that will transform the way clothes are made, sold, used, disposed of, uh, and radically improving social and environmental outcomes across a $3.1 trillion apparel and textile industry. So what are the most interesting trends that you're seeing today in sustainable fashion? It's a big question, and I'm going to add on to it. Uh, what do you find most troubling about the current state of the apparel and textile industry? What do I find most troubling? Um, so I think I'm going to start with that. Uh, the speed of adoption of new technologies is something that there's a disconnect between, I think, the way that maybe some consumers 
um, and as well as a lot of the people within brands who are actually would be interested in adopting these technologies, understanding of how long they might take to grow. So one of the things that concerns me the most is uh, honing in on either short, medium, or long-term thinking instead of thinking about all three at the same time and developing a strategy that is recognizes how long it may take to adopt some of these things that can be massively transformational while also acknowledging that they're things that can be done now. And so I think uh, sort of rewinding and getting to a place where that is acknowledged and brands as well as suppliers are working together and saying, okay, this is what we can do now. This, which, you know, something like a chemical recycling, we were just talking about this earlier, can be massively transformational, but it's not gonna happen right now in the next two years. It's something that will be in the next 10, something like Altex, you know, as we'll, we'll get into amazing and is able to be implemented on a very small scale now, but will be a while. And so we need to say, what can we do now? What can we do in the next five years? And what will it look like in the next 10 years and be setting ourselves up for that? Um, and I think there's a lot of disconnects with that still within organizations. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, uh, Myra, over, over to you. I mean, especially, you know, what you're building with Altex. You know, we know it takes time, uh, a lot of grit, I'm sure. Um, you know, Altex is creating a sustainable polyester alternative um, from food waste. I mentioned uh, you were my inspiration a little bit in my opening remarks. Uh, I just think that is so cool. Um, you know, I think, tell us a little bit first, what impact does polyester have? Why are we looking at this uh, to begin with? And uh, yeah, what makes it so problematic? Yeah, thank you so much. I love that analogy. I'm gonna use the food waste throwing on shirts for all of my presentations. Um, so before I answer the question around the problems of polyester, the first thing that we should all acknowledge is that 60% of this room is wearing polyester, right? So this stuff is here for a reason. There's properties about polyester that we really love. The reason over the past uh, century it's been adopted so quickly is because there is incredible durability, wrinkle resistance, uh, quick drying property. So there's a lot of merit and there's a reason why it's the, the leading textile. The problem is that we're using this textile and we're generating it from the world's most scarce resource being petroleum and fossil fuels. So that's one of the biggest issues with polyester is this plastic that's in 60% of our clothes is made of oil, or this, this fabric rather, is made of oil and plastic. What that's doing is it's generating 50 million tons of annual landfill waste. It's one of the leading contributors to ocean microplastics. Um, and there's no end because of the acceleration of fast fashion. So it's just continuing to fuel it. So GHG emissions, just tapping into that really quickly, the emissions produced by polyester, according to some stats, are sometimes almost 2x that of other counterparts like cotton and natural fabric. So there's a significant footprint. The other aspect of this is plastic perpetually never leaves the earth, right? So as we landfill the stuff, as it goes to our oceans, our waterways, um, it's here to stay. Uh, the challenge is, as I mentioned, because we need it, we need to figure out how to make it not from our world's most scarce resources, but perhaps from the world's most abundant waste sources, food waste being one of them. Um, so for those reasons, I'll kind of keep it at a high level. That's why polyester has a massive impact on the planet. And I think you tapped into something, I mean, with using the food waste, I think economizing um, our waste industry uh, and th there's this coming together and the creative thinking of, of, you know, fashion and science, you know, using science to economize, uh, that is, is really brilliant. Um, Roya, I, I watched uh, you, one of your uh, TED videos and was so inspired by the way you talked about color and, and living in color and um, the dye and pigment industry is, you know, identified as one of the biggest pollutive and toxic industries. Uh, and you have founded Light One, uh, which is developing a solution for this, dyes created by bacteria. Tell us about your technology and how it works. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, as you watched, colors are a really significant portion of our lives, and I personally can't love, live without them. But um, it's really interesting to know that they're so beautiful, but this portion of the supply chain is often overlooked. Um, and yet, it's a major contributor to all the negative impacts of the fashion industry. Um, this sector hasn't had like a meaningful impact for almost a century now, and I think it's time. It's time for a shift. It's time for a future forward thinking in it. Um, it's pretty ironic. Something so, so, so beautiful that we are so dependent on, color, is extremely harmful and toxic. Um, 
we believe that beauty shouldn't come at a high cost for the environment. Leveraging functions of microorganisms like bacteria, we can create the next generation of 100% sustainable color uh, in a circular system. Many microorganisms naturally produce these beautiful, vibrant colors, and um, using synthetic biology and uh, advanced biomanufacturing methods like precision fermentation, we can grow the future of color um, at the lab in just a couple of days without labor-intensive processes or environmentally exhausting uh, methods, and while maintaining a complete closed um, circular manufacturing system. I mean, it would make sense to lean on nature to create those colors because nobody, nobody does it better. Exactly, and it's so inspiring that these tiny, tiny parts of this world have figured it out a lot better than what we think we do, so. And Adam, I'll, I'll bounce over to you. I mean, we obviously heard uh, about the amount of plastic that's in our clothes, and denim is uh, not exempt from that. Uh, and it might surprise our audience to learn that Triarchy is the only brand to have plastic-free stretch denim. So tell us about your product and, and the stage you're at. I like that line leaning on nature because, I mean, in the denim industry, we've all been conditioned to expect stretch in our jeans, and that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, of course, what that means is every pair of stretch jeans that has ever been made and sold has been done so with crude oil-based plastics, whether that's recycled or virgin, it's all the same to me. Um, and so what that means is all of the stretch jeans we've ever owned will be around for hundreds of years after we're gone, which seems a little shocking to me, because if you go into a store and you look at the denim wall, it's big, and it's all plastic. So. We, as a brand, decided to not use stretch materials whatsoever, which you can imagine is quite challenging as a denim brand, because when you only have rigid, you can only sell so much product. But through that refusal to use plastic, uh, we ended up developing the world's first plastic-free stretch with our mill partner, Candiani. Um, and so we derived the stretch from rubber, from the rubber tree. It biodegrades in less than two years. Um, and it actually just received composting certification from the EU um, to show that it enriches soil health while it degrades. So the idea is if we can, and I only speak to denim because that's my industry, but if we can shift the denim industry to one that relies on natural stretch fibers as opposed to plastic, you can imagine how the impact would be greatly reduced. So that's what we're trying to do. That's amazing. Um, I mean, that sort of taps into the whole idea of circularity and closed loop. And, and uh, I'll go, to Leslie, to you. You know, when we talk about circularity in textiles, what's kind of the gold standard? And what are the key components of a, of a truly sustainable fabric? Well, I think the short answer is we're not there yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because when you, when you look at even natural fibers and things like cotton, the infrastructure in the system doesn't exist yet to take it back and actually turn it into something that's circular. We blend, you know, thinking about blending stretch and cotton and denim in, in a way that is not yet currently, you know, the commercial infrastructure doesn't exist to actually take those things back and recycle them. So I think the gold standard will be something in the future where we have a system where there is an end of life for garments that have actually reached their end of life that is not the landfill. And I think that our retail infrastructure will come into that in some way to enable their customers to bring things back and then for it to be sorted and go to the right facility for those things to turn back into fibers. And so if it's a blended fiber, to be able to break that into the cellulosic component and the, the synthetic polymers and then those go back into their supply chains, it will be a long time before that that can happen and it'll be, you know, it'll start, it started happening now, one of our portfolio companies does that, it's amazing. We'll have fibers that, like all techs, that are from, you know, existence, actually circular, um, and those will exist and I think there will be a sort of a portfolio approach, if you will, of things that are fully circular, things that are biodegradable and can go back into the environment, and a system that exists to take things back and for them to have the longest life possible. And so I think it takes every kind of step along the way. It takes the use phase, things having a longer life through resale um, and things like that as well. But the whole, the whole big picture is a system where things have as long of a life as possible, and when they get to the end, they're able to be recycled and turned back into fiber and not just go back into other systems with lower value. 
Yeah, so sort of scaling up the, the systems, the municipalities, the, the functionality of being able to, to do that for sure. I think the same challenges, you know, um, arise from developing, you know, new fabrications. You know, Myra, um, what challenges have you faced in scaling production? That must be a big challenge for you as well. Yeah, scaling biotech is not easy. Um, I think just before I talk about the challenges of scaling, one comment on the golden rule, and I think you, you, you answered that beautifully, but what we were discussing previously and what Leslie and I have previously chatted about as well is um, we overemphasize the golden standard a little bit too much, right? There's this kind of paralysis by analysis that happens um, from the industry because everybody is searching for the perfect fabric, but there needs to be incremental innovation that's picked up by the industry as we, as innovators, figure out how to solve every single problem. Our fabric doesn't solve every aspect of the problem, but it solves many and it's ready for market. So we need brands that are able to accept that as we continue to figure out the rest of it and scale. When it comes to the challenges of scaling, there's the um, actual technical challenges of figuring out how to scale up the fermentation process, right? That comes down to the logistics, the operational infrastructure, and the technology, uh, which many of which we've actually figured out. We're creating whole shirts and garments that we're sending off to brands, so we're well on our way there. The, the biggest challenge to scaling is going to these brands and saying, hey, I have this fantastic shirt for you. It has twice the breathability of polyester. It's stretchier than polyester. We're not quite there for a one-to-one -one with durability, but here's all the incredible things you can make with it. Let's get to market and then figure out how we can scale it and optimize to then do a long-term play. The challenge is many brands hesitate with that early adoption. No one wants to be first to market with a risky product. Um, there's a handful of brands that are coming out that do want that, that want to be known as the risk takers and the innovators. So we work with them until the kind of mass momentum uh, and the wave comes so that we can scale and get to market faster. And the final component of that is the plug and play aspect is critical. The fashion industry has been here for centuries. It's been here since we've basically been on this earth. We're not going to overhaul the system. We need to figure out how to create raw materials that plug into the existing system, which is what we're doing right now. Um, so those two things kind of enable the scale. And I think when you talk about um, early adopters, you know, I think that goes for brands, but it also goes for the investment community as well. You know, a lot of um, different investment and capital companies, you know, they'll, they'll look to uh, invest in brands that have already kind of made it when actually the upfront investment really needs to happen. We haven't quite made it yet to, to get there. So, um, you know, Roy, I'll jump to you. You sort of touched on it already, Meyer, but, you know, how important is it to have solutions that do plug into the existing system? And, you know, I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, it's a system that has been quite traditional and slow in, in adoption. So how do you make that connection? How do you plug into the systems that we already have? You know, it's a hard question to answer, but um, it's super, super important to offer something for any innovative solution that comes along uh, for them to be able to fit within the existing infrastructure uh, infrastructures of the industry. Um, having worked in the fashion industry, being at the other side of uh, the table in this game of receiving and hearing about all these innovations that were trying to be adopted by us at the time, um, I often saw these amazing innovations just struggling because their solutions were uh, syncing up with the way how things were running or um, basically op being operated at the time. Um, imagine this, as Meyer touched based on it a little bit, if these super cool, innovative, high potential innovations come along and demand a complete overhaul in the way how the manufacturing systems are set, run, um, all the way across over the seas of multiple different factories, workers, and all of that, or they just demand a complete new um, distribution channel that is going to be really difficult to manage for um, how the system is set up right now. Um, they are going to face an uphill battle. Um, and no matter how promising these solutions are, if they're not compatible, they're just simply going to be pushed aside. For us especially, I think it's really important to be able to offer something that fits and matches with these systems because I can just speak for all of us because I know I talk to you all the time that um, we are after a real sustainability change, not just greenwashing, a band-aid or short-term solution. And in order to do that and make a real big impact, not only make a big impact, but also um, do it fast 
to hit all these climate action goals, uh, we need to make sure that they fit into these existing infrastructures now. Um, I personally think that there is no more time to um, just sit around and try to like, you know, do damage control. So it's either now we have to make it work or not. And I think with all these advanced technologies, we can make it work. Can I just add, yeah, of course. add, add something to that? I think it, we've been investing since 2019 and started the concept for our fund in about 2016. At that point in time, the drop-in technologies things for a lot of the material science, it just wasn't there. And we'd seen a lot of companies that didn't have that aspect raise a ton of money and fall kind of flat on their face, frankly. And so I think there was a reticence to move into this industry because of that. And it's been amazing to see over the last few years that change and for that awareness to be there. I think in the investor community, it's still very difficult because this is an, under, an industry that is very poorly understood. It's one of the reasons why we came into existence is because understanding the supply chain and understanding how things move through a supply chain, you can't do that. You can't. It's a really hard thing to make an investment. And so all of that is to say, I feel like it's been shifting over the last five, six years, and it feels like there's more money flowing, and I hope you all feel some sort of optimism around that as well. Um, but now the, we do. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the fact that that's something that you're thinking about from inception to the beginning of your company is really important. You touched based on a really, really great point right there. Every single garment that you just go to the store, buy it, the supply chain in the fashion industry is so, so, so complicated. Without understanding it throughout, it's going to be, frankly, impossible to offer any solution. Yeah, I agree. And that's something that maybe, you know, as consumers, people don't usually realize how the, the complexity of it. Um, Adam, I'm going to jump back to you. Uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, launched a project called the Jeans Redesign a few years ago, right up your alley, where it engaged brands to rethink the denim manufacturing process, eliminating chemicals and designing jeans that can be easily recycled. So how do you balance the competing factors? You talked about, you know, it was hard to sell jeans that didn't have that stretch or, you know, durability, uh, affordability, uh, compostability, uh, you know, with the rigid certifications and, and parameters. I mean, I know as a, as a retailer, we, we lean on those certifications, you know, as our governance, um, but with so much innovation going on, you know, that's kind of the wild west now and it's harder to navigate. So, you know, how do you, uh, how do you balance those, all those competing factors? The, the programs and the certifications that you mentioned um, were really important to us when we were starting because they provided a nice framework and a guiding light to, you know, stay, stay in the right lane. I quickly found, however, that um, they were limiting and I think that I think that they all set out to do amazing things. But, for example, um, with the one you mentioned, the Ellen MacArthur, they have a very strict um, process about what they will allow to have that certification, and that has to have a 98% rigid material and 2% stretch. And when we first developed the plastic-free stretch, we found the recipe that worked best was 96.4. So we brought to market a fully organic uh, compostable stretch, which to me is the holy grail of denim, and so that should be at the top of that list, but they wouldn't accept it because it wasn't 98.2, and I'm like, but wait, everything in your portfolio is 98.2 crude oil-based plastic. I'm bringing you 96 for everything natural, and you're saying no, and I was like, I think we just have to move away from this, um, because if I was to follow that, then what would have happened to being able to actually bring this to market? And I think that we were in a very unique place because we were not a brand that was heavily invested into plastic fabrics. And I, I think we were the only one that had said no to plastic. So when this was an opportunity, we could invest in it fully. And I understand why larger brands have a harder time adopting things like this because they're so deep into their investment in delivering these products and their reorders that it's almost impossible to move the ship. Um, so I love the certifications and I love the framework that they provide, but at some point, if I find that it's gonna be hindering our process, then 
you know, we depart with love. You're, you're innovating and moving forward faster than the certifications can keep up, uh, which is, <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to leave it with that positive. <laughs> I, think, I think all of you are. Uh, I mean, I think that also brings up uh, a very sensitive topic. You know, you know, we look at certifications so that we can have our governance in place to avoid any greenwashing. You know, we can make sure that our I's are dotted, our T's are crossed, and we have all paperwork in our back pocket. Um, so let's talk about greenwashing. You know, Leslie, I'll go to you. Um, you know, what should consumers be wary of when it comes to sustainable fashion, knowing that actually sometimes certifications can be a hindrance. Uh, you have innovations like Roya and, and what Myra are working on that, that there are no certifications for that yet, yet they're so bold and audacious and, and really moving the needle. So how can customers navigate that space? Oh, man, I think it's... Um, Education. I think it's it's partially education, but you you know you rely on brands as marketers essentially. That's that's what they do to to share with what they're doing. So I think, to me, customers looking at brands who are very transparent about what they're doing and call out the areas that they're actually not good at yet. So seeing the whole balance of the situation where maybe you're saying. It, it, acknowledging that it's not like a look over here. So a lot of times brands will do one small thing in one article of clothing and do a pilot collection and it's trying to be a distraction from all the other bad things that they're doing. So to me, I think the brands that acknowledge where they have shortcomings and where they're trying to change and how hard it is to do that and being very honest with their customers around that are typically the ones who, that actually aren't greenwashing and you can feel comfortable or actually moving in a direction that is positive and supporting brands that maybe aren't perfect because actually none of them are, even if you know they're doing really well, um, is to me, I think, probably the, the best way to go. I, uh, so I think I'm always contemplating, and, and I know we all talked about this earlier when we spoke, you know, with that, you know, where does the responsibility lie? Where, you know, if you think of chicken and egg, um, when, when it comes to, you know, the responsibility for this, you know, is it, is it with the brands, you know, the producers, the, the retailers? Um, you know, I'm going to throw that out to all of you. You know, where, where do you think the biggest mover, shaker needs to lie? I can go first. Um, personally, I think it's very fluid. It's not going to be strictly just on the brands, consumer, governments, or any of that. I feel like we all different, take different roles at a time whenever it's necessary. Innovations would create this innovation, bring it out to the world, show it, create the demand for the brands. They create the market pool for the manufacturers to demand it and manufacture it and bring it to life in a larger scale. And then the consumer um, in the background, or recently, they're a lot more aware of it than before, and they're demanding it as well. So all this push and force is coming from all across the sectors, and I don't think it's, uh, it's on one single um, part of this whole process at all. I mean, only being able to speak from a brand perspective, what I learned is that um, we can only share all of the things that come out of my mouth if we have third-party auditors vet and publish it after I say it. Because the truth is, everything I'm saying here could be a lie. And I think a lot of times greenwashing happens, I, I don't always think it's malicious. I think people take things at face value and they bring it down the pipeline and then it it ends up on the shop floor with a tag that says sustainable and everyone's like, yay, and it's like, huh? So I think we have third party auditors vet everything we say and do and they publish the information independent of us on our website. So you can go, you can click and download the organic cotton certificates for this gene as well as the transaction certificates because that's very important too. And so if a brand is speaking for themselves, to me, that doesn't, that doesn't cut it. It has to be through another channel that is reliable at doing that. I mean, it sounds like a whole ecosystem. Myra, yeah, if I can just jump in, I think I definitely agree with what everyone's saying in terms of it being an ecosystem effort, but I think we have to acknowledge that everything kind of influxes at the brand level, right? The brands are the ones that interface with the manufacturers, the customers, 
they are the, the biggest lever we have, and they're also the ones with the biggest problems, because the brands are the ones that are push, pushing fast fashion, and they're the ones that have committed almost half the fashion industry as part of the G7 Summit Fashion Pact has committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. There's no sign of them reaching that target, um, and synthetics like polyester in, in some cases are 30 to 40% of that lever, right? Um, so brands are absolutely responsible, I think, because also they're the ones that are balancing their own balance sheets and choosing between profitability versus sustainability, even though it's not really much of a balancing act. They have the biggest choice in the trade-offs to make. Can I add a little controversial yes, bit to please, that, too? Of course. So I think that last point that you made, I think it's, and this is a pipe dream, but I think so many of the large brands that are out there, public companies, and it, it's incumbent upon the investor community, particularly in the public markets, to say that we're worried about what climate change and what lack of resilience in supply chains and what your labor looks like in your supply chains and put pressure on the brands or at least support them yeah. in making shifts that alleviate some of those pressures and make those changes and allow them to move away from a mindset where they have to be so beholden to quarterly earnings and can't think longer term about some of these decisions that they need to make. And maybe that's where policy comes in. No one's ever, you know, we haven't really talked about policy, but if there is no choice, if this is, you know, the red line as to the expectations to do business in this country, if this is what it looks like, you know, we know EU has passed um, many new policies around the transparency and, and visibility that brands, retailers alike, companies, private or not, have to share. Um, you know, I think that also really pushes brands to and forces them into into the right place. I just want to add to that. You mentioned a really great point about supporting each other throughout this whole journey, and I think that's really important. Like, I don't personally think I was on the brand side, I was on the design side, I was on like all different parts of this whole supply chain, and I think we have to stop this game of putting it on somebody else. It has to be a supportive, collective effort of caring and trying to support each other throughout this whole journey. Um, that's the only way to battle this whole beast. Yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we're at time. I could stay up here all day and <laughs> talk with, with you all. Um, but I think, you know, just to, to recap, you know, at least what I've taken from today is, you know, what was sort of traditionally uh, slow to adopt seems like, you know, by the mere fact that we have no choice. There is such exciting innovation happening in the textile uh, material world, in the fashion world, um, and if we can galvanize this you know, ecosystem that we talk about together from policymakers, investors, uh, brands, you know, it's a really, really exciting space uh, to be in. So thank you to the panelists today. Um, you're all really inspiring and amazing. So, and thank you for everyone here. Thank you. Thank you.